Okay, so uh, today's speaker is Remrov, and the title is My Art and My Autism. Remrov is an autistic savant and self-taught pencil artist who specializes in photorealistic drawings of everything he finds interesting, mainly animals. Due to his autism, Remrov sees the world differently and in tiny little details. His drawings tend to be this way too, very precise and detailed. The whole world is a very chaotic place for him. When he is out in public, it is very difficult for him to focus on so many details of sensory input at once. Uh, when he's working on a drawing, he only has to focus on one thing, the details of his drawing. That's one reason why Remrov loves drawing so much. All right, so I'm uh, very eager to, uh, for this uh, lecture. So uh, I'd like to introduce Remrov. Thank you very much for uh, introducing me, and thank you very much for having me. Okay, I'll start then. I'm three years old. My mom takes us out for a walk. I constantly look down at the sidewalk. I'm fascinated by the pattern of the light gray tiles and in between them a thin strip of moss. The constant repetition of it makes me feel safe. My mom tells me to look up and to see the world, but the world is too overwhelming and unpredictable for me. So as soon as I was uh, old enough to hold a pencil, I was always drawing and I mostly drew like patterns of shapes like that and colors <coughs> because it really helped me to deal with the chaotic outside world. Next. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, also a cartoon I made. I'm six years old, my first day of school. I step onto the schoolyard and get overwhelmed by the noise of the other kids. They are laughing, talking, shouting and playing games. I don't understand any of their words and any of their games. I'm frightened. My twin brother, my example, whom I always mimic to get through social situations, is not here with me is not here with me. I decide to sit down on a bench by myself. So as a very young age, I was uh, very aware of my uh, differences and my uh, difficulties. Uh, I saw that uh, everybody else, all the other kids of my age, they were very outgoing and they were interacting with each other. And with me it was different. It, it felt like I was kind of locked up inside of my own head and I couldn't find a way out of that. Next. <laughs> Although um, I find it a lot safer to, to be all by myself, I was very, very lonely. And drawing always helped me a lot to uh, deal with everything. I drew uh, cartoons and funny creatures and all kinds of uh, friendly aliens and then I imagined them being my friends and that, that was a way for me to deal with my loneliness. And I also noticed that whenever I was drawing, like when we visited people, I, um, I noticed that everybody just left me alone because I was focusing on my drawing so I wasn't forced to communicate a socialize that was both so difficult for me. <laughs> I'm 10 years old. I'm walking in the schoolyard. I don't fit in, but I want to so much. But I don't know how to communicate and how to play games. Then I start to study all the other kids and I memorize all their words and all their actions and I just literally mimic them. Even though I don't understand a word I'm saying or what I'm doing, the other kids believe it and I finally start to fit in. <laughs> With uh, the classes in elementary school, I didn't have much success at all though. Um, autistic people, they don't have a filter 
like neurotypical people do. So we can't really filter out um, information, like sensory input that is important to us. So everything comes in just as loud. So when I was sitting in the classroom, uh, besides uh, the teacher's voice, I also heard like a lot of voices coming from outside, like cars and bicycles and dog barking, somebody sweeping the, the sidewalk, for example, and noise coming from the from the schoolyard and from the hallway and noises from the classroom next to ours. So for me, it was ex it was just impossible to filter out the teacher's voice. So I practically missed everything the teacher said. Besides that, I also have an extremely <coughs> sensitive hearing. Um, when I was little, my mom thought I was deaf because I didn't respond to, to when she called me. But I had a hearing test once, and uh, the lady who did the test to me, she was like totally amazed because I could hear sounds of frequencies that other people couldn't hear. And often those sounds are extremely painful for my ear, for my ears as well, and I just feel them like right through my teeth. And when I'm sitting on a bus, for example, <coughs> I don't just hear one sound coming from the engine, but I hear like 12 different sounds coming from the engine. So it's like often I get like a sensory overload because of all the sounds that come in. And next. <coughs> now, even when I um, did hear the teacher talking, I often didn't understand what he was saying because you can see a story as a puzzle, at least that's how it is for me. The words are the puzzle pieces of a sentence and the sentences are puzzle pieces of a story. And I have to hear every single word in order to understand a sentence. So if I miss half of the words, I just don't, I can't make sense out of it. Besides that, I uh, take language extremely literally, and words also often have a double meaning. And people always tend to use a lot of like metaphors and sarcasm and jokes. And for autistic people, it's extremely difficult to understand sarcasm and jokes and metaphors. So in elementary school, I had a lot of bad marks because of it. And well, the teachers often really got angry at me. And every morning, I was just frightened to go to school. But eventually, I started to make all these tricks to like cheat and to, to uh, like look at the other kids' uh, work to get good marks. For example, I used to drop like, a pencil right next to somebody else's desk. I would bend over, something like that. So, like, so like, I could look at the other kids' work, and then I just did exactly what they were doing. Often I took my schoolwork home, and then my mom would ask, like, okay, what is this? What, what did you draw here? And I said, I don't know, somebody else's, I just literally copied it from somebody else's work, so I didn't even know what I was doing. Okay, next. This is a cartoon I made. This is like inside my head. I have certain born inside my head. Um, this is how uh, information processing works in, inside my head. Um, I can explain. And there and there and over there and this one. Those are sensors, like the eyes and the ears where the information comes in. And then through those cables, the information has to be transferred to the circuit board where it's, it's going to be processed. And as you can see, a lot goes wrong. There's an explosion, explosion <laughs> and information gets lost. And the brain cells are fighting, they get overheated and they start to fight. So by the time the information gets where it's supposed to be processed, only half is there. So, so the, the brain cells get like really confused and they can't make sense of everything that came in. Uh, the, the title, by the way, I grew up in the Netherlands and the title, it means um, information processing company Remra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next.
This is my literal world. As I said, I take language extremely literally and I also like to make uh, cartoons out of that. So these are three examples. Uh, next. Bending over backwards. <laughs> next. Elbow grease. I find it really gross when somebody says that because I see this look. <laughs> next. Through the door. Always when you ask for directions somewhere, they people say you go through the door. <laughs> right? That is. It sounds painful. <laughs> um, I have a few more. Taking a pee. I see somebody scooping with a hand in the toilet bowl to take a tea and take a take a pee out of it. Take a seat, also the same. I mean, you sit down, you don't pick up the seat and take it somewhere else. Calling for rain. Also find that very weird. Why would you call for something you don't want? <laughs> And head off, we have to head off, people say. I see his, his head bouncing down the street. <laughs> or runaway health costs. People complain about runaway health costs. It's a good thing, right, if they run away, because then you don't have to deal with it anymore. <laughs> and uh, the other day I had a tooth extraction, and my... Um, uh, my mom called me from the Netherlands and she asked me, so how's your molar? I said, well, I don't know, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm very visual. I see, I, see, I see literally happening in my head, like when somebody uses expressions like that. And even though I know the, 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 the metaphorical meaning of something like it, I always see the literal meaning first. And then you can imagine that it takes some time for me to process and to understand the actual metaphorical meaning of it. Okay, next. I'm 15 years old. I'm sitting in the classroom. My body still hurts from the beatings from the other students during lunchtime. My mimicking trick doesn't work anymore. When school is out, I'm helping the janitor with chores around the school like I have been doing for the last three years. The janitor is very nice and I'm having a lot of fun with him. And in the meantime, I'm avoiding all the bullies and my stepdad at home as well. <laughs> so, um, socially it was extremely tough for me. In middle school, I was bullied practically by the whole school and uh, beaten up. It went quite far. I was beaten up every single day and at home as well, so um, it was not really a fun time. Uh, the classes were even more difficult for me than in elementary school because there were a lot more chaos in middle school than in elementary school, a lot more noises, the students would just suffer and things like that. What I also found really chaotic that uh, we had to change classrooms um, in, elementary, in elementary school, you can sit in the same classroom the whole day. In middle school, you have to change classrooms after every class and then go through the whole chaos in the hallway with all the other students. I had a lot of tricks, though, to get good marks. Again, um, I have a photographic memory and I use that to get uh, good marks for tests. For example, if uh, if I had to like, we had to study a lot of pages for uh, for history. For example, I took the book, the history book, and I just memorized every single page. I memorized the, the page numbers. Mm -hmm. I memorized the pictures on every page, the, each column on 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 all those pages, and every single word without really understanding the text. And it's like I took a picture with my mind of every single page. And then when, when we're doing the test, when the name came up in a question, like Napoleon, for example, I knew exactly on which page number it was located, <laughs> which words there were around, and which pictures. And, and that way I could get a, a, a good mark for, for a test. Next. Um, of course, 
in those years in middle school, I was very lonely as well. I didn't have any friends. But uh, drawing again helped me a lot with my loneliness and also um, to, to, to have a good mood and to make myself laugh. I feel like these cute ducky creatures. And this is an example. Next. This is also an example. Um, I, uh, every now and then I dreamt about funny creatures and then I would wake up in the middle of the night and make a sketch of it and then the next day I would make a drawing out of it or cartoon, finished cartoon. Next. I'm 18 years old. We're on a school trip. We're staying in a hotel. The teachers say we have to form groups to share a room. I ask all my classmates, but nobody wants me in their group. I don't know what to do. I ask the teachers for help, but they get angry at me because I'm too childish to get a group together myself. So after middle school, I did graphic designer school on the teacher's recommendation because I was so good at drawing. But um, during that education, I had more and more troubles because the older you get, the more is expected of you social, so socially. Um, again, I was bullied, but especially left out of everything. The classes were also more and more difficult. Um, I put a, a huge amount of effort into understanding everything. Uh, for example, um, I went to the library after school to learn about topics that we talked about during school in order to, yeah, to learn more about it and maybe I would understand them, but it just didn't work. And even the teachers, the teachers gave up on me because they were tired of explaining things over and over. So it just wasn't a success at all. Next. I'm 21 years old. I just had to quit my education. I'm totally burned out because of trying so hard all my life. Even though I've been tested many times before by psychologists, my mom decides to have me tested once more. I finally received my diagnosis, classic autism. All the puzzle pieces fall into place, and I finally know why everything is such a struggle for me. I'm 25 years old. Even though all my words and all my actions were always mimicked, I gradually found my own words inside of myself. People always thought I was dumb, but it turns out I have an IQ of 158. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by quantum physics, math, neurology, and many, many other branches of science. I want to have a job now, and I want to have friends. I want to be part of life. But no matter how hard I try, and no matter how skilled I am, th things don't work out because of the social aspect. So I'm sitting at home most of the time and do some volunteering work way below my intellectual level. And the only friend I have is my bed parrot Pila. So after my um, autism diagnosis, I was recommended to live in an institute. And there were counselors there and they recommended that I would do voluntary work for an organization that was connected to the institute. And while working there we received uh, all kinds of assignments from companies and um, I was assigned to make drawings and paintings and signs for all those company for, for all those companies and then the organization would get paid for it and I wouldn't get anything. <laughs> so, and, and I wasn't allowed to talk about that, especially not to, to the people um, from those companies who paid the organization. So after about a year working there, I felt kind of used, so uh, that I was being used, so I quit. And then I started doing volunteer work for three police stations. And I uh, worked on the cars, I washed the cars, I checked the equipment of the cars. 
and I uh, like the oil and things like that. And that was really fun. The police officers were all really nice, and I had a lot of fun there. And in the meantime, I also did uh, commissions, um, drawings and commissions for for police officers. Next. This is uh, a drawing of a house I did for one of the police officers. I went to his house to take uh, photos of every angle of his uh, house and then I made a drawing out of it. Um, he was very happy with it. And uh, I had a lot of fun working on it. And um, this is um, a cartoon drawing I made. After working for three years at the police station, I, um, I, I quit because I wanted to start an education, just to try it again. And this was a goodbye present I gave to one of the police stations. I drew, I, I drew every, uh, almost every uh, police officer in it. And uh, I'm also there. <laughs> right, right there. Uh, washing, washing the car, and my pet pair Pilaf is also there, he's sitting on the car, if you can see him. Because I often took my pet pair Pilaf with me to the police, to the police station. That's uh, quite fun. Next. Oh, well, um, doing volunteer work, I also started on a comic book, just for myself, because I like to do it. Um, this is uh, a, um, a comic book with my uh, pet parrot Pilaf as the main character and he's having all kinds of adventures in space. These are ex two examples of panels I drew. Next. And these are two uh, other examples. The original is in Dutch. I, I have not finished it. But I, I still plan to finish it and have it published sometime. I think that would be kind of cool. Okay, next. I'm 33 years old. I'm an intern at a histopathology lab in a hospital for my education, which I started two years ago. I'm very excited and I'm eager to learn. I have I have all straight A's and I'm, an, and I'm the highest graded student of the whole school. I'm destined to succeed. But, my lab, but the lab technicians in charge are very hesitant and unsupportive from the beginning and they won't give me anything to do but the most simple task, while my classmates get to do everything. I'm bullied by all my co-workers and one of them tells me every single day that I have a serious defect. When I eventually complain about it, they fire me on the obvious, ob obviously false grounds that I don't learn fast enough. They lied to everybody and said that I quit. Um, during this education I had a lot of fun though. Uh, the, the classes, they really fit in with my interest, with, my, um, with all the science I was so interested in. And so it was really fun. I studied at home a lot because in school it was just too chaotic and noisy for me to like, concentrate on anything. I especially liked uh, our uh, histopathology practicum class. And during that class we had to study tissues under the microscope. And then you had to make drawings out of it. So um, that's an example of vocabulary that I, that I drew. But, um, I'm very perfectionistic and I made those drawings extremely detailed and they took too long. <laughs> so um, every week we had a whole list of tissues with diseases in it that we had to like identify and draw like that and I didn't get my list done because I just asked too details with the drawing, with the drawings. But I had a very nice teacher and he, uh, he didn't mind, he was okay with it if I only did half because um, he loved my drawing so much. Unfortunately, the whole education fell through because of what happened with my internship. It was really sad. Next. This is also an example of um, one of the drawings I made during my education. It's lining of a stomach. 
Okay, next. I'm 40 years old and I'm here right now talking to you wonderful people. My life has changed a lot the last few years. Four years ago I immigrated from the Netherlands to Montreal with my pet parrot Pila <laughs> to, be, to be with my wonderful partner Edward. I have re-established my self-esteem and I've been extremely self-analyzing in order to create a life for myself that is manageable. I've realized how important it is to share my story and to teach people about what it's like to be autistic. So, I give presentations about autism on a regular basis and I have also specialized myself as an artist in realistic pencil drawings. Next. So that's a koala. Um, this is koala Oxley Twinkles and Oxley Twinkles is a koala who has been taken care of by the um, uh, Koala Hospital in Port Macquarie, Australia. I'm a huge animal lover and I always love to help animals with my drawings and to, to donate part of the proceeds to um, organizations that help animals. And of this one I donate, donated part of the proceeds to the Koala Hospital. <coughs> That's an elephant. <laughs> um, I love, I truly love any elephants. I just, I just have, I've read a lot about them, and they're just such, they're very intelligent and emotional beings. They're, they're really remarkable. I, I love drawing them. Next. Oh, wow. That's um, a tiger drawing. I also really love. To draw tigers because they have so much contrast in their fur, the stripes. I um, had a lot of fun with this one. Um, unfortunately, tigers, like many other wildlife animals, are also endangered. It's uh, quite sad. I, I saw this original to a person in the United States. This is a drawing I call Lion King. Uh, it's one of my favorite drawings. Uh, I, I truly love lions because they're so majestic. And I saw this uh, original to a person in Zambia. That's uh, Mr. Rhino. This is one of my most detailed drawings. Uh, the original is 14 by 17 inch and it took me about 120 hours. I, um, I really love working in such tiny details. It, uh, the originals, uh, it's also done on, on white paper, actually. I, I, I just colored the background black with a graphite pencil. <laughs> That's my uh, little feather, feather friend, Bila, who unfortunately passed away last year in March. He was my friend for 18 years. And uh, he was also registered um, as my um, therapy support animal. He helped me out a lot with the, with the challenges I face as an autistic person. He was the first bird ever to be um, what do you call it? registered as a, as a therapy animal. Yeah, so I, I wanted to make a drawing of him. I did it when he was still alive. And I struggled a lot with the drawing because I, I, just, I was like extremely perfectionistic and I really wanted to do him justice and I kept erasing which is something I never do because when erasing you really damage the paper and make smudges especially with a colored pencil but eventually I'm, I'm quite happy with uh, how the results turned out. perfectionistic and um, I'm not easily satisfied with my own work at all and um, I, I'm, I'm better at it now but meltdowns were not uncommon during uh, making pencil drawings. <coughs> That's uh, a brown bear, also one of my um, yeah, favorites. I'm quite happy with the result and uh, this one is salt as well. 
Um, when I'm working on such details, it really helps me to ground myself because the outside world is just so chaotic. And when you when you when I'm out in public, you have to focus on so many details at once. And when I'm working on a drawing, I only have to focus on one thing: the details of my drawings. So this this original is sold uh, to Andrew Molson, by the way. He's a friend. Of mine. Besides drawing animals, I also really love to draw buildings. This is Christchurch Cathedral here in Montreal. And I donated it to the church to help with their fundraising campaign for, for the repairs the church needs. I just love repairs the church. The original also took me about 120 hours. That's the bearded dragon, and um, as you can see, many details in color. I find it a little bit more challenging uh, to draw with color than in a graphite pencil, but I, um, I, I really love it to, to do it. And the original is sold to uh, a Facebook friend of mine. Let's oh. try <laughs> It's my comedian drawing. Uh, it's about the drawing that took me the longest of all my drawings. It's 18 by 24 inch and it's sold to a, a Canadian art collector. Um, and it, that's a woman who also has this organization called ENCA. And ENCA gives out these international awards every year. Um, it's called an INEP. I have awards, which means International um, Naturally Autistic People Awards. And last year I, I, um, I won an international oh. award in the category of art. So that was really really cool. Yeah. This, this I call No Booking. Mm -hmm. I, I finished it recently in January. Uh, original is also uh, 18 by 24 inch, and it took me about 150 hours. Mm -hmm. And w when I finished this one, I, I, I uh, decided to start selling the limited edition prints. Mm -hmm. This one I call Cut on Me, <laughs> because he just looks so cuddly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love tigers. I've never done a tiger cub before, and this is the first one I did in color, which um, was challenging, but also a lot of fun. This one is a little bit smaller, it's 14 by 17 inch, and it's original, still for sale, and I also sell limited edition prints of it. That's uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch. Yes. I, uh, I also do portraits every now and then, especially in commission for other people. And this is Cumberbatch as Sherlock. I love the TV series, Sherlock, BBC yes. TV series. I think the character might be autistic as well, because I relate to the character a lot. And I actually hope to give this one to Cumberbatch sometime. I hope to meet this, this actor sometime. I hope to give it to him. Yes. And this is my most recent finished drawing, and I'm calling Chillin' Tiger because it just looks like he's chilling and relaxing. I finished it about yeah, two, three weeks ago, and I enjoy um, really working on it. It's, I love the close up of his, of his face. Next. Um, this is a squirrel, it's a little bit older, maybe a few years ago. I, uh, I, I thought the, uh, the difference in texture of the fur and the bark, the tree was quite challenging. Next. Mm -hmm. And that's the tree he lives in. <laughs> <laughs> I did this one, I don't do it often, but every now and then I make drawings in pen. And the bark I did with the pen, and um, the, uh, the leaves with the uh, colored pencil. 
Um, besides working on these surrealistic pencil drawings, oh, next. Besides working on these realistic pencil drawings, I also started making videos about autism, which I post weekly on YouTube and Patreon. I find it very important to keep raising awareness and understanding about, about autism, because when I look at my past, I see a lot of situations which <coughs> autistic people, or anybody else for that matter, shouldn't have to go through. If only there was more awareness and understanding. So I want to prevent the things that happened to me from happening to others. I made about 102 videos now, and it's, it's going quite well, actually. Got a lot of positive response um, about them. I made an, uh, a video about eye contact once, why uh, autistic people tend to avoid eye contact, and that one has at the moment 107,000 views. And I, I also made a video about the TV series The Good Doctor. Uh -huh. yeah. I really love that because it has an autistic main character. Mm -hmm. And that one also did very well at the, at the moment. It has 77,000 uh -huh. uh, views. And with my Patreon page I have a bit of income every, every month. Next. So I don't see my autism as a disability or as a disorder, it's often called that, but it only becomes an issue when other people expect us to be neurotypical. Mm -hmm. Many autistic people have quite some talents and gifts, and I actually love to see like the other way around. When you have talents and gifts, then something has to give. And those with autistic people, those are often the things neurotypical people are good at. And this is actually a really good thing, I find, because um, autistic people and neurotypical make, um, neurotypical people can make great teams together. They can, they can complete each other. Yeah, autistic uh, people can be a huge a positive asset for society, in my opinion. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
you are reaching out to have us understand that you are a forerunner of the possibility of what we try to say is art because at times I would say you are a rarity. Thank you very much. You're a beautiful animals. I notice a lot are down with white lines on dark background. How does that work? Um, actually, I do all my drawings on the white, on white uh, paper. And for example, if I draw a tiger and it has white whiskers, I just draw around the whisker. I just leave that part white. What, what, what is your uh, <coughs> process? Do you work uh, in the mornings? Uh, like your whole process? Mostly in the mornings, yeah. Because then I, I have most of my, my energy in the, in the mornings. And sometimes I'm, I'm, I, I keep drawing all day, sometimes I even forget to eat and drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so, and everything is from photos? or Yeah, from photos. Sometimes from more photos. And sometimes most of them from one photo. Oh. Yeah. Sometimes I take photos myself, and sometimes I, I find photos on uh, this is a special website called Pixabay, and there you don't have to be um, you don't have to worry about copyright um, laws. So um, yeah, because for me it's a bit difficult to take photos with lions since they're not like <laughs> walking around in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> How does it work with your commission work? I mean, like somebody contact you and you have like a deadline or something like that? Uh, people can uh, people can contact me and then they can just send send me a photo like a, a really high resolution photo mm -hmm. and yeah, but when the person lives close by, I can just meet them, you know, to like. Um, so they can see that they can see the drawing, and otherwise, if it's like from the UK or so, I just mail them the drawing. Brilliant presentation. <coughs> I, I love your name, but I'm wondering, since you're from the Netherlands, was it actually Vormer? Yeah. Were you Vormer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, 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 I used to talk backwards a lot. And uh, so I thought it was nice to have my artist name run off. Because my, my, my last name is spelled backwards. I see things like you Are you familiar with the term indigo child? Indigo child? Yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, I don't know much about it though. No? I'm wondering if you're one of them. Because you're so gifted, you speak so well, Thank you. you draw so well, I, I think perhaps you are. Oh. You're very, very special. I'll look it up. I'll, yeah. I'll read a bit more about it. You should. I, I've heard about it. I would just like to say that I, I think you're, um, you are here today because you have a tremendous amount of strength. You had a lot of hardships in terms of school and people, etc. And you never gave up on yourself. And I think that's commendable. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much.